Hello, everyone. In Cura, the National Council of University Research Administrators is pleased to welcome you to our second webinar on research administration in a time of disruption, the impact of COVID-19 on university research and research management. My name is Mark Schiffman, and I'm the managing editor for Incura. Today's webinar is being produced by Incura's Global Initiatives, which keeps research administrators and the research community connected throughout the world. Global initiatives include global webinars, global workshops, global fellowship programs, and resources for international collaboration. For more information about our global initiatives and the resources available, please contact our senior manager, Claire Chen, at chen at incura.edu. As we continue to monitor the COVID-19 situation and its impact on our activities, our members from around the globe have been sharing their situations with us and how the virus has impacted their university's research environments. This webinar is being recorded and will last 90 minutes. The recording and slides will be available on Incura's global webinars webpage in a few days. We will have 30 minutes for Q&A a after all three presentations. Please type your questions in the chat box to send to the organizers anytime during the webinar, and our staff will collect your questions to share with the speakers at the end of the webinar as time allows. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Simon Carriage is the Director of Research Services at the University of Kent in the UK. Giannis Lagoris is the Head of International Programs and Vice Head for the Department of Strategic Cooperations and Research Funding at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in the Helmholtz Association in Berlin, Germany. And Michelle Bowles is the Director of the Office of Policy for Extramural Research Administration at the National Institutes of Health. All three speakers have been involved with Incura and participated in many of our educational programs. We understand this is a challenging time worldwide, so I'd like to thank all three of you for your dedication and commitment to the research administration community and for helping us keep the community informed. We'll start with Simon's presentation, followed by Giannis, and then Michelle. Simon, the floor is all yours. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Mark. So let's see if I can work out how to share my screen and we will be ready to go. Um, I'm hoping you can see the screen up there and hopefully somebody will tell me if we can. Yes. Perfect. OK, great. In that case, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, as Mark said, uh, my name is Simon Kerridge. I, I work at the University of Kent in the UK, so it's very easy. UK, UK. Um, I've got 20 minutes to enthrall, excite, or maybe keep you awake. Um, uh, and then we'll pass over to Yanis, uh, uh, who I'm sure will have far more exciting things to say. And then, of course, uh, the main event, which will be Michelle. So for those of you who, for some bizarre reason, don't know anything about the University of Kent, I'll, I'll give you the, the brief heads up. Um, we're a fairly new university, just uh, 55 years old. Um, we have campuses uh, dotted around the, the southeast of England and uh, the northwest of continental Europe. Um, so you can see in front of you, um, you've got Canterbury, which is the main campus where we're based, which is um, Canterbury of Canterbury Tales, if you like. Uh, it's the, the seat of the Church of England in the UK. So the cathedral is somewhat older uh, than the university. Um, we also have a, a couple of other campuses uh, in the UK, so at Pedway and at Tunbridge, which are closer to London. Uh, but we also have uh, centres in, in Brussels and Paris and Athens and Rome. Um, we, we badge ourselves as the UK's European University and still do, notwithstanding the Brexit word. Um, and you can see a, a few facts and figures um, there just to give you an idea. So we have a, around about a, a thousand um, researchers of, of various flavours. Um, we also have some very excitable people when they get graduated. Um, and just in case uh, you, you can't 
work out which blob is Canterbury. Uh, that's me there uh, in, in the red one, which is where I'm currently sitting. And, and it's getting much closer to Winnicott here than it is in the States. Um, if you can't work out exactly where that bit of Europe is, because uh, I know it's a, it's a bit of a, a weird shot, um, then there we are uh, at the, at the centre of the world. So just to, to sort of give you a bit of context, should anyone wish to come and visit me when we're allowed to travel again. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit about me. Uh, you can um, see my lovely profile there, and um, that's that's me sort of walking the dogs. Obviously, not quite the same photo, but uh, uh, you can imagine me uh, being trailed behind in the in the snow, which we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm I'm pretty old, so I've been a research manager for about 25 years, and I've done quite a few national things. And I'm not going to talk through all the various committees and things I've been on because that would be very boring indeed. But I thought I better mention um, the Incura one. So I am a member of the Select Committee on Global Affairs. Uh, I've also been a, a global fellow, so I visited the US for for a couple of weeks. Um, back in 2016, doesn't time fly. Um, and I've also attended one of the Encura Enrich uh, workshops as well. And uh, Claire told me if I didn't mention that, then she would never speak to me again. Okay, so um, just in case you think that by any chance that isn't a realistic photograph of me, um, some of you may recognize Daniel Craig, I mean, I don't know. Uh, that's actually more like what I look like. Um, and for those of you listening to my voice, I know in your mind, and for those of you who may possibly have met me, you know that in reality, probably it's more like that is what you're thinking about when you, when you hear my dulcet tones. Okay, so working from home, um, and there we have a photograph with a, a, a couple of my dogs um, who are indeed therapy dogs, and I might come onto that later on because we all need a bit of therapy these days. Um, so what have we done in terms of um, all this COVID stuff? Well, we of course, the university had a disaster plan, yeah, sort of not really. Um, but we, what we did have was it was a Brexit plan. As you saw from the, the map, we're fairly well in, in the southeast of the UK, very close to continental Europe. Um, there was a lot of worry about uh, if there was going to be a hard Brexit, what would happen at the borders. They were expected to be three day long queues of, of lorries and uh, the A2, the big uh, interstate near us uh, would be closed and people wouldn't be able to get to work because they wouldn't be able to travel. Um, so uh, so we actually had a lot of things in place from the beginning of last year um, for a particular different reason for not being able to travel. So actually, because of that, um, we had mobile computers for all of my staff because we, you know, we worked out roughly how might we be able to, to, to go forward. Uh, of course, things are, are slightly more difficult now because we are actually unable to go in, um, you know, even if we went sort of in the, in the middle of night or, or whatever. Um, but we've, we do have a, a fairly mobile working environment anyway. You saw the campuses and we travel between the campuses quite a lot. So, so in effect, our mobile working is now just a question of are we working in the kitchen or in the front room? But, you know, we have that mobile equipment. Um, the main issue is actually, have you got desk space or a, or a decent chair? And when you were working from home because you weren't able to get in, actually, that was probably OK. But when it turns out that there's three other members of your family also working from home or studying or whatever, you probably didn't have four desk working spaces. So so what do you do about that? Um, the therapy dogs is actually quite a nice thing because they're very used to lying on their back and, and getting stroked. And um, if you anyone's has a dog, you probably know that you get a, a lot of a lot of joy and de-stressing from just interacting with them. And I can now do that a lot more than I used to. So so that's great. There is an upside. There has to be an upside, right? Um, I mentioned. Um, the IT, the hardware side of things, so uh, the uh, the portables and so on. Now, I, I'm a bit of a, an IT geek at, at work. I've got three screens and I get on really well with those. At home, I've got kind of one and a half screens with the portable and I'm certainly not being as productive. We've also had some problems with software. So uh, there's a particular process where we convert a proposal into a project when it becomes funded because they're two separate systems. Uh, and that process uh, only works if you're actually at the University of Kent in that IP range. It didn't even work over, over, over VPN. Uh, I, I, information services have now sorted that out, um, but it took a disaster for them to sort out something that we've been asking for for ages. Uh, and I mentioned Sirius Web there, that's a national um, costing software tool, which 
only works if you're on campus, notwithstanding the fact that it's supposed to work when you're not. Um, since about the last three weeks, we've been doing a lot of Microsoft Teams. We've been Skyping, we've been Zooming, we've been using Google shared documents, um, but also we've been using those technologies for things other than work. So last Friday, we were all supposed to be going out for a drink, but we decided to stay in and have a drink and, and do a quiz. So, so we, we, we're getting on relatively well. Uh, what I find though, and I don't know if anyone else would, would reflect this, is that because I'm not work, used to working at home, looking at a small screen all the time, and perhaps not having that opportunity to just walk around uh, to the next office and speak to somebody, then I'm, I seem to be getting very much to this kind of virtual tiredness. Uh, and because of that, the university has um, given everyone uh, an additional two days off for this week and next week. So we can take a one day tiredness off uh, and uh, one day tiredness off is, you know, it's fully paid, it's additional holiday in effect, uh, which is quite interesting, but challenging when we come to deadlines. Uh, I've put a little link in there for um, some, some tips from working from home. Uh, okay, so of course our researchers, well, they are affected in differential ways. Those who work in labs have real problems, um, unless of course that lab has been opened because we're doing COVID research and then there are some issues to, uh, there as well. Um, I, uh, in terms of facilities, um, we do have a shared school of pharmacy with another university and they have a slightly different protocol for getting into that building um, and so kind of half the building's closed and half is open and, and it's all very very complicated but in effect we are on sort of a, a Christmas period so most universities in the UK in effect close down from from Christmas Eve until about the 2nd of January um, but it is sort of slightly worse than that and then there's all those other issues to do with researchers who might need to travel or, or are unable to travel, uh, people not being able to get visas or out of their visa um, allowance now. Uh, we've got um, one um, Marie Curie uh, researcher, it's an EU funding scheme, um, who uh, a few weeks ago went home to visit his family in India. Um, he now can't get back to the UK or Europe. And so technically, uh, we are, should not be able to pay him because he's not in an EU member state, which you have to be as part of this scheme. At the moment, the European Commission are being very flexible on that, but it's a question of how much longer will it, will it, will it go on for. Um, and the big thing to remember is that working from home has hugely differential effects. Uh, if you imagine your 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 lone researcher, sort of um, you know, uh, a bachelor or um, uh, uh, unattached uh, female, uh, then they might have the house themselves be able to do exactly what they want. If you go to a, a single parent with three kids, that's a very different situation to be in, and you just cannot expect any sort of uh, equivalence in in terms of uh, research and or other sort of work that's being done. There's then also the fact that for, for most academics, research, although it's their top priority when they've got the time, they absolutely have to get the teaching done. And the teaching is probably taking much longer with all these uh, online workarounds that we're now using. And they might also, if they do get any time, be focusing on trying to get a research output done rather than a, a new research proposal or indeed finishing off the research project they have. Huge issues with conferences, um, of course, not being able to travel, and that's disrupting uh, just about everything, but although potentially giving us more time. Uh, in the UK, we have this thing called the Research Excellence Framework, where every six years, all the research across the country is assessed. Um, and so we do a submission and then get a core funding for that for the following six years. Um, Everyone is working towards that because the deadline is this November. That's just been pushed back and we've no idea um, what we're doing on that. Um, a good resource uh, I found for uh, what researchers might need to do um, is uh, the one that Stephanie Scott's put together at Columbia. And again, that, that link is there. Uh, in terms of specific research funding issues, um, again, there's probably nothing here that you've not come across yourself, and I don't have a magic bullet, but we can perhaps uh, talk about things in more detail in the Q&A. Um, we're getting a, a lot of deadline extensions for proposals, um, which is which is great. Oh, and by the way, Encura themselves have a research program, and they've extended the deadline for that. So that's now uh, next Friday. So you've, you've still got time while you're sitting at home twiddling your thumbs. Um, and that also been quite a lot of relaxation in terms of sign off. So uh, quite often if you need a signed letter uh, or, or from your department or whatever, then an electronic email rather than a scanned, even stuff like a scanned document might be more difficult to get. 
We have a lot of problems with uh, projects uh, might needing to delay their start uh, because they can't recruit the staff, the staff can't arrive. Um, that's a particular issue for fellowships where it, it's, you know, somebody has an individual fellowship to come and work with us for a year. And so in order to do that, they need to find some rented accommodation. Well, they can't find the rented accommodation because they can't get here. And even if they could find the rented accommodation, then they, they can't get here because of the travel restrictions. Um, of course, no cost extensions, our favorite phrase, are, are fairly easy to come by, um, but what do you do with the staffing in the interim? Uh, the UK has a, a furlough scheme where if you are not publicly funded, so perhaps you're doing a research project uh, funded by a company, um, then while you are unable to do that research, the government will pay the university 80% of your salary in, in order to pay you. My university has taken the decision that we'll top up that, that difference to, to pay the 100%, but how long is, is that sustainable for? Um, of course, specific COVID-19 projects themselves as an accelerated process. So we have this uh, fantastic, in inverted commas, uh, UK scheme, um, sorry, UK funding process uh, where you submit online uh, through something very, very similar to the, the things that NIH and NSF use. Um, for these new COVID projects, it's uh, uh, send us an email with a Word document in, which itself has challenges because I, I don't know about uh, about you, but some of my academic colleagues are very keen to get uh, proposals in and may forget to tell us that they put one in. So, you know, that, that can be a problem. And again, if you're particularly interested in, in the UK funding um, uh, issues, then there's a couple of links there. So um, what's gonna happen in two weeks, two months, two years time, yeah, not two weeks, uh, when things have settled down a bit. Uh, well, um, here is my second work office. That's the sort of the, the, the kitchen extension um, with uh, my, my my therapy dogs there. They're not all officially therapy dogs, but they are to me. Um, but what is it that we are going to be facing when we put our research offices back together? For me, the IT infrastructure is is that underpinning issue. And I don't just mean underpinning inf infrastructure in terms of having the computer, it's having that reasonable bandwidth. I've had um, a, a conversation with my three associate deans for research. Um, one of them, her broadband does not work very well at home. And uh, you know, she was just cutting off all the time and it, it made, the, uh, made even just having a conversation very difficult. Um, there will be, I think, a lot more virtual working. And of course, there's going to be a lot more flexible working. Um, for me, what we need to think about is that integration of systems. I talked about two systems which weren't connected properly, um, but I'm thinking not only about our systems in our institution, but systems across the country and across the world just, just need to be a lot better than they currently are. Um, the other problem is, is keeping that sense of team. I mentioned, I mentioned that quiz that we had on, on last Friday night, and that was really good for, for bringing the team together. Of course, not all the team could make it, but having those sorts of informal you know, coffee mornings or nights out or whatever it might be um, is essential. And if you're all working remotely, then um, having those team meetings is, is just, just a problem. If you wanna have a, a, a simple five minute conversation, um, I tried to have one this morning and it took about half an hour's worth of email and we'll do it then or no, I can't own another call and so on. So you, you've kind of wasted half an hour just having that five minute conversation that, that, you, that you wanted to have. So will there be fewer meetings or more meetings? Well, that's anyone's guess. I think even when we get back into the real world, the, the old normal, my feeling is there will be less travel anyway. And the, we've seen a lot of virtual conferences uh, popping up. Will we see a higher proportion of virtual conferences? And I think we'll probably definitely see more collaboration uh, more generally because people are used to um, reaching out and talking to people virtually more. And so I think we'll we'll see that more in the in the research administration field. Um, and of course, finally, if you need to relax, then what you need is somebody's tell me to rub, uh, you know, preferably a canine, but um, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. So. That was probably more or less everything I, I wanted to say. I think I managed to manage the time reasonably well. Um, I, I would say fire questions at me, but you've been told how to do that already. So uh, I think I'm done. I would normally leave with a joke at this point, um, but um, I will spare you. So uh, uh, Mark, perhaps you want to uh, hand us over to Yanis.
so I would like to thank uh, Mark and Claire for this uh, invitation to share with you our experiences from, um, from Germany and our institute. Uh, thank you, Simon, first for the insight about how you're dealing with the situation in the UK. It has been yeah, difficult for many countries to establish new measures uh, in a very short period of time. And uh, yeah, here you can see a picture of me with the background of our institute. And uh, uh, yeah, I will start about uh, with introducing our institute, uh, the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine. Uh, here you can see a map of uh, Germany with the location of the MDC on the top uh, right part of the, of the country uh, in Berlin. The MDC is one of the institutes in the Helmholtz Association and Helmholtz is Germany's largest uh, scientific organization. It has more than 38,000 uh, uh, 38, uh, staff with a total of more than 4 billion euros annual budget. Uh, we have 19 national research centers in the strategic fields uh, of aeronautics, earth and environment, energy, health, matter and key technologies. And here in the map you can see the locations of the institutes uh, working in uh, life sciences that are scattered uh, all, all, all across the country. Um, at MDC, our mission is to carry out biomedical research that is aimed at determining the molecular basis of the processes of health and disease. And uh, what we aim at is turning this knowledge into better strategies to prevent, diagnose, and treat human diseases. So we are a basic research institution, but always with a focus towards diseases. And until now, we do have a specialization in some specific fields of diseases like cardiovascular, metabolic, cancer, or diseases of the nervous system, but we are not limited in those diseases. We have a new part of the institute working on medical systems biology. We have a large cooperation uh, with the Charité, uh, that, is the, that is Germany's largest university hospital uh, for translational research, and we have also a large infrastructure and technology uh, platform. Uh, investment. We have an annual budget of more than uh, 100 million euros and our research is uh, yeah, divided in 70 different research groups and 14 different technology platforms. Uh, English is the working language of the institute. Of course, German can be heard a lot, absolutely, but uh, more than 50% of our scientists come from abroad. And we have in total uh, about 1,700 uh, staff and guests. And about me, uh, I have just uh, put here some uh, information about my roles in the, in the last decade. I studied uh, biology, uh, informatics, and then I did a PhD in cell biology and mathematical modeling. And immediately afterwards, I started in 2011 uh, working in science management. And since 2012, I have been specializing on EU projects and EU uh, corporations. And I have had leadership roles since 2015. I have been a member of um, the EU Life uh, Grants and, and Funding Strategies Working Group. EU Life is a large organization uh, uh, composed of uh, 14 now research institutes in life sciences in Europe with the goal of exchanging best practices and promoting research excellence in Europe. And since 2018, I've been responsible for international strategic cooperations. And uh, then recently, I have been member of the board of the International Region uh, Region 8 of Ankura. Uh, I was also awarded an Enriched uh, Travel Award in 2018, and I was very happy to do that. Uh, this was uh, uh, my first experience with Ankura, and uh, it has been increasing ever since. So I would like to tell you a bit about uh, the actions that we started at the Institute in the beginning of March. That was when the number of cases started increasing more in Germany. And then uh, we saw the necessity to start with some institutional, institutional measures on how to cope with um, with the current situation. So first, uh, while still the institute was open, we had an official communication from our leadership urging people to stay at home in case of 
any even light uh, symptoms appear. So this was a first measure to make sure, because the cases were increasing rapidly, it was important to make sure that if people have any sort of flu-like symptoms, then they should not come to work and uh, they should come into contact with their immediate supervisor and with the leadership and then the situation would be assessed on a, on a case-by-case basis. Immediately afterwards, we had a cancellation of events and business trips, and this happened in accordance with the regulations of the state of Berlin. And we uh, received many emails urging us to uh, help and make sure the video conference systems uh, were functioning. So this was to prepare ourselves for a future uh, uh, close down, which was happening in many other countries. So we wanted to make sure our infrastructure was uh, was adequate. It was, of course, difficult to make sure that everybody had the licenses needed for uh, video conferencing and also difficult to make sure that all employees had access to the uh, to the servers or to the computer programs from home so this of course did not work perfectly in all cases but uh, it worked uh, it worked pretty well and we had also the establishment of a hotline for mobile working and support for personnel to start uh, working uh, remotely Additionally, and this was very important for the proper running of science, we had a plan to prepare for uh, running of research projects for a uh, possible emergency operation. So uh, the people were advised to uh, check how they can scale down their projects or how they can change their, their research in order to be able to uh, go to a potential lockdown without losing any active experiments. So this happened before the Institute locked down, and I think this was a key uh, decision to make sure that the people are properly prepared for the potential uh, lockdown. Additionally, what we did is that we had a list of key personnel in case the Institute goes in emergency operation. So we had established conditions uh, which people could function as key personnel uh, in the uh, in every individual department so that we know that these people can get access to the institutional premises uh, if, uh, if a lockdown happens. So this, of course, as in most cases, did happen and the Institute entered in emergency operation as of March 18th. And uh, then most of the research projects were stopped or were put on hold, apart, of course, uh, uh, from the projects that can continue uh, uh, get done remotely because we have a, a big part of our research that is uh, happening through bioinformatics or programming and uh, quite a bit of that can continue working. And we also have uh, research projects on COVID-19 and these are the projects that are given a priority now and uh, both as far as access to animal facilities are concerned or also access to research infrastructures or IT infrastructure. Uh, there um, has been a crisis team that has been established and is meeting uh, every day, virtually, of course, and they are uh, talking about news about how things are working with the animal facility, with the other research infrastructures, and with uh, our IT. And it has a strong focus on communication and decided on uh, which information has to be uh, um, forwarded or organized and sent to the entire community of the Institute uh, in accordance with changes in the local, regu local regulations or decisions of the government. And what is very important is that from the very beginning, we have set up a new page where uh, that is dedicated to COVID-19 news, both as far as internal policies are concerned, as well as external regulations and news. And this has been um, uh, yeah, updated uh, regularly, and all information has been put uh, transparently on that page. So this is, in general, about the institutional uh, decisions, but of course, at the level of the department, it can be very different depending on the situation. As Simon mentioned earlier, uh, there are some people for which home office can work pretty well if uh, they have uh, they have space or sufficient bandwidth, or if uh, uh, they have uh, the freedom to be working all day because they don't have to uh, take care of, uh, of other members of the household. 
uh, but uh, this is not the case for uh, the entire department. So definitely, we this is a factor that only now uh, becomes clear on what an effect it has on the motivation of, of, the, of people and also of, uh, on, on the productivity. So before the emergency operation in our department, what we tried it was to uh, purchase extra laptops and extra licenses to make sure that a future home office would be enabled for the majority of the people, or if uh, an extra laptop could not be purchased because of delivery limitations, then we had the uh, uh, opportunity to use uh, the already existing equipment, and then we were uh, in touch with the with the IT to be sure how this works uh, uh, better. And also after the emergency operation, what we have done is we have a continuation of the team meetings that we had that were weekly, and we are continuing with them as a teleconference. As Simon said, it was a bit difficult to decide how often do we need to meet, how often do we need to communicate with the team to make sure the motivation is high, the productivity is high, but also we are not spending the necessary time on uh, checking uh, people or doing teleconferences. And this is something that we decided we should continue on our routine exactly as we were doing on uh, on the normal uh, on a normal week. Uh, so we have kept the team meetings weekly as we had them in the past, but we have increased the one-to-one -one communication for bilateral meetings. So this is kind of the replacement of what we had in the uh, yes, yeah, stepping uh, next door and talking to the people next door for a quick question. We have replaced that, of course, with uh, bilateral meetings and we'll try to not do it with all people at the same time because this will lead to unnecessary work. Uh, we have had to reallocate, of course, uh, projects depending on the capacity of people to work at home. And this is something that we have paid extra emphasis uh, too, because this was important to make sure we continuously assess the situation of who can work from home, how does it work with people with small kids at home, how much time can they spend, how, e how easy is it for them to uh, accept a teleconference during a day when the kids have school work. So this is something that we are constantly reassessing and trying to reallocate projects depending on the actual capacity of people to work. And of course, we have placed increased emphasis on supporting the new COVID-19 projects. So we are trying to prioritize support for those projects. And as far as uh, grant management is concerned, as Simon also mentioned, many funding agencies are changing now the conditions, both as far as eligibility of costs is concerned, as well as uh, which uh, deadlines are strict and which uh, reports uh, are, uh, are due and how exactly we can send them. Uh, cases of new contracts are becoming, of course, very, very tricky, especially for fellowships. And uh, we are in a constant uh, discussion with, uh, with the funders because they are also changing the regulations all, all the time uh, responding to this crisis. So what we have noticed is that we are forced to uh, uh, pay stronger attention to uh, priorities and we really have to check all the time if something that has a deadline today, it is really important to do this as a priority now or if we have uh, another project, especially if it is related to COVID-19, that we need to uh, deal with uh, uh, before that. So this is this is something that we are all experiencing now for the first time and compared, uh, combined with the reallocation of projects depending on the capacity of the people, I think this becomes a real challenge in, uh, in our departments at the time. But of course this, uh, uh, this crisis uh, will present uh, opportunities as well. So for quite a few people, uh, we hear that uh, think that this situation can lead to an increased acceptance for the need uh, of uh, sufficient personnel to assist scientists uh, as much as possible. We have noticed and we have had some discussions uh, concerning that in our department, how much this current situation can provide an extra motivation for research managers because seeing a global crisis where only science now can give a definite solution, this can be a very motivating aspect for us in the research management field to know that we are helping scientists as much as we can 
either to get grants or to assist them in writing grants so that they have they can have free time as much their free time as possible to uh, work on uh, on their research projects. But of course, what we realize is that we have an extra need for effective communication challenge, uh, channels uh, with our colleagues. Uh, these communication channels are different depending on each uh, situation, but definitely in order to work remotely, we need uh, state-of-the-art IT systems in science management as well, as we uh, know uh, how the IT systems are increasing and they're becoming more and more advanced in um, uh, in the scientific infrastructures, we need the same uh, state-of-the-art uh, systems as far as workflows are concerned or uh, document access or uh, bandwidth. We need that in our uh, departments as well to make sure that in such cases we can work remotely and if the personal uh, situation uh, permits with uh, as much efficiency as we could be doing it from our normal workspace. But apart from that, there is also a hope that there will be some changes in the world as far as the acceptance of the importance of science. And uh, it is uh, our hope that we will see an increase in, of the importance of global cooperation since now we see that we have a global challenge that cannot be solved on a local, uh, national level. And I think for us uh, grant managers, it is a... Uh, this is a great opportunity because we're used to working across borders. We're used to uh, uh, have a global network and talking uh, to funders and scientists all over the, all over the world. And this is something that uh, now has to receive much more attention. Also, we can see an effect, a potential effect on open science and sharing of resources since we have had an unprecedented uh, sharing of information across borders. Uh, and also that we see a cross-sectoral collaboration so that we can make sure that the results from uh, basic research and the understandings of the basic mechanisms of, uh, of how the virus works can be translated into uh, uh, patient, into some results uh, for the patients. And uh, of course, the big focus is that the big hope is that we are going to have an increased focus on how science policy can influence future political decision making so that we make sure that either we can predict such a crisis in the future earlier on or that we will be able to respond as effectively as possibly when, uh, when the crisis comes. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would like to pass uh, the presentation to our next uh, speaker, uh, Michelle uh, Bulls. So, Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. We can hear you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can you see my screen? Stand by, Michelle. I think we had seen it, and then we did. There it is. We do see Great. your screen, yes. Perfect. All right. So today I'd like to share with you all information um, regarding NIH funding related to COVID-19. But first and foremost, um, I just want you guys to know that you and your families are and our thoughts and prayers just across the country, across the globe, um, just to make sure that you guys know that um, here at the NIH, we are committed and remain committed to making sure that our recipients have the up-to-date information that's needed in order for you all to continue as best you can um, with these circumstances. So, um, as we've stated in many of our NIH guide notices, um, as well as just communications that um, my office um, and Dr. Lauer's office has had um, with the applicants and the recipient community um, from the NIH perspective, we are very much concerned about the health and safety of our people involved in NIH research. Um, and this is an unprecedented um, uh, situation where we have outlined um, and worked very closely with our colleagues um, at OMB and at the Department of Health and Human Services level 
to make sure that many of the administrative flexibilities that are outlined um, in the OMB memo, um, subsequently the information that we've shared um, in our NIH guide notices and a plethora of um, external FAQs outline um, how those flexibilities apply um, so that um, research can continue. One of the things that I think we have to remember is we are receiving hundreds and almost literally hundreds of questions a day. Um, and the situation continues to evolve. Um, we continue to get uh, additional information. Um, we continue to come up with other ways of addressing questions and concerns that our recipient community has. And we have tried to keep the information up to date as much as we can um, with me and my team doing daily huddles um, in the morning, pouring over the questions that are coming in from you guys, as well as our internal NIH staff, um, and making sure that that information is updated weekly. Um, so I know that you'll probably see a lot of the FAQs that um, just managed to change um, over time. Hopefully, though, the messages are clear and, and remain consistent, and we're just adding additional information to help you guys know how to um, move about um, during this time. The information that's presented in this particular presentation is current as of April 3rd, um, and we are now still working on some of the uh, newer FAQs that you'll see come out um, by Friday. As you well know, and as we've heard from many of our colleagues, uh, we are very much open for business, for business and extramural staff, as, as well as some of our intramural staff, are working remotely. We are continuing to make sure that the application um, applications are processed, um, reviewed, and remotely, of course, and then we are making awards uh, from our different uh, 24 uh, institutes and centers that have grant-making authority. What we're trying to do is make sure that we're providing um, up-to-date information on funding opportunities, working closely with the department to make sure that language and that opportunity is clear so that we are able to give all of the flexibilities that we need to give um, in order for our applicants to apply for opportunities, whether they're COVID-related or not. Um, Moving into the next slide, we've had so many questions from our um, from you guys um, asking about whether or not um, NIH is going to allow for institutions to donate supplies uh, and equipment. And um, we've been very clear from the beginning that um, you know we want to make sure that we give and provide as many flexibilities as we can while protecting the integrity of our um, grant-making uh, requirements. Um, but what we have determined is that we will um, definitely allow for our recipients to donate uh, PPE, but we're placing some guardrails um, around how that looks for um, NIH and um, additional information to that point will come out. But recipients... Um, may rebudget re grant funds to um, replace supplies at a later date. Um, the use of large unobligated balances is going to be really critical um, during these times um, for uh, being able to replace some of those supplies. And then at the um, after you've you know looked at your large unobligated balances and you've rebudgeted, um, if there is a need to request administrative supplements, um, NIH will uh, uh, consider those supplements on a uh, case-by-case basis within the IC, and we would only be able to, of course, provide the funds um, to support supplies that are directly charged to the grant um, and not um, not in the indirect pool, uh, cost pool. If you have questions about what that looks like, because it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I do request that you reach out to your program official um, or your grants management official with specific questions. We have a link here in the presentation that um, provides um, answers in detail uh, for the FAQs related to donating research supplies and other types of questions that I know you all have um, for us. 
The application deadlines, this is another area where we've tried to really provide some flexibility. My office um, put out guidance um, and FAQs as well to outline the fact that we are accepting late applications uh, through May 1 for deadlines between March 9th and May 1. We also uh, do not require uh, justifications for the late submission, though the initial guide notice stated that we to have a justification. Um, if it's COVID-related research or if it's um, an institution that has been affected, which many, if not all, have been, um, there's no need for a justification in, that, in those cases. And the later guide notice outlines that, um, and the notice uh, link is below. Um, we are also allowing for FOAs that are expiring within the same time period of the, between the March 9th and May 1. Um, those will be extended as well. So guide notices, um, I'm sorry, funding opportunity announcements that were due to expire are um, going to be extended um, by, um, I believe it's 90 days, um, we put in the um, in the. Uh, in the guide note, in our last guide notice. So take a look at that. Um, and if I've misspoke, if it's not, it might, it might be 60. But um, we do have um, that extension available for our applicants to make sure that um, we provide maximum opportunity for you to apply for funding. The salaries and stipend, if, um, if, if we have key personnel or personnel that are unable to work on the grant or conduct training activities, um, salaries and stipends um, may be charged to the NIH grant only when the institution's policy allows for such charges um, from federal and non-federal funds, and it's, and it's um, consistently applied. And it doesn't mean that institutions need to put out new guidance um, or new policies. Um, typically, what we're talking about here as it relates to the organization's policy is where there are um, policies in place at your institution for disasters or um, how they handle it, how they handle human resource um, administrative uh, leave, um, where there are disasters and, and that kind of thing. Those are the kinds of policies that we're talking about. And if the, po if, 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 if the institution does not have a policy that allows for administrative leave and flexibilities, um, then NIH would not allow those um, charges to be um, made toward the grant. Um, and then, of course, if there's a need to divert faculty from research to clinical work related to COVID-19 to support the care of patients um, until the end of the public health emergency, um, NIH is not requiring um, prior approval for, for such um, cases. As it relates to guidance on human research affected by COVID-19, of course, the goal is to make sure that the safety of all human participants and research staff involved in clinical trials and human subjects are the priority. Um, and so what we're asking our, our recipients to do is to consult with the local IRBs and institutions about protective measures, limiting studies um, to the, to, limiting study visits to those that are needed for participant safety or coincident with clinical care. And then, of course, conducting virtual um, study visit, visits, implementing flexibilities that are required for laboratory testing and imaging that's needed for the safety monitoring. And NIH is committed to the flexibility regarding project extensions and accommodating unanticipated costs on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, um, contacting your program official and grants management official um, specific to the projects and within the ICs um, that support your projects is key. Uh, I talked a little bit about the fact that NIH is working very closely um, with OMB and HHS on administrative flexibilities. Um, and these administrative flexibilities have been outlined in our guide notices as well as outlined in our um, in our uh, staff uh, guidance internally, we have been working closely with the grants management officials um, to make sure that they understand what these flexibilities are, how they are applied, and that they are applied consistently across the NIH enterprise. Um, we have um, allowed for pre-award costs to be incurred. Some of these costs and some of these flexibilities were already in place 
for biomedical research. Um, so that was a good thing. But what we've tried to do is extend and expand those um, that have not been extensions of post-award reporting, of course, is an, a, a definite um, flexibility. And then prior approval requirement waivers um, will be in place as well as numerous flexibilities regarding the expenditure of funds. Um, we've tried very hard to also highlight those areas where there would not be a need for um, SAM registration um, or, or re-registering um, if, if there's a situation where an applicant does not have the current SAM registration. Um, we are now putting out NOFOs that um, are less than 30 days and, and making sure that folks understand that this is an emergency and it's allowed by um, um, HHS and NIH policy that we do so. Um, and then, of course, we have um, outlined um, non-competitive um, continuations where there may be a need um, to um, re-budget or um, a capitalize off of um, work that is currently done under one um, biosil, for instance, um, Corona. There's a research study being conducted under Corona, but now the research wants to shift or pivot to specifically COVID-19. Those are some flexibilities that are there that we're um, asking our recipients to contact the ICs when those cases occur. Um, but we really are trying very hard to, to just think of many different things um, that we can allow and, and provide flexibilities for um, so that you all have the ability to, um, you know, maximize the existing resources and support uh, as well as address um, what you need to address under the COVID-19 um, restrictions. Accommodations for loss of research time, again, we talked about extensions for um, early stage investigators and the eligibility due to COVID-19 um, disruptions. Those will be considered. Um, NIH will also be flexible in extending time constraints for fellowship, career awards, and training grants, um, including phased awards. So uh, we will, we're looking at all such requests. Um, for extensions for our trainees, our fellows, and that kind of thing. Um, and those all will be considered. One of the things that we're trying to make sure of is that we provide consistent advice for our applicants and recipients, which is why we're really um, asking for the uh, for our recipients and applicants to contact OPERA, um, which is the office um, that I had for, for details. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, for general questions. Perfect. But for details, you'll need to contact the um, NIH um, IC that is awarding uh, your grant or providing funding to your, your grant because we want to make sure that if there are specific questions that you have those answered by the appropriate officials within the institute and center. Um, otherwise, general questions um, like those that you see in the um, FAQs are those that we would, uh, with an opera, um, answer for you. And for that, I'm done and happy to take questions. How do you engage with faculty to encourage grant seeking while they're working from home? Yeah, okay, sorry, I thought you were going to ask what my joke was, but yeah, no, okay. So, um, yeah, that's interesting because, as I pointed out on my slide, uh, they have other priorities. Um, even if they are working at home without any distractions because you know they, they live live alone or uh, they don't have their family and they don't have you know cats walking on the keyboard or, or whatever um, then they have other priorities I mean for us we're getting close to exam time and so getting that that, that final student experience in terms of delivering uh, those those lectures um, is is has to be top priority um, and for us, online delivery is something that's relatively new. We've been doing it for about 10 years, but for about 3 or 4% of our delivery. So there's you know, hundreds of members of staff who have never done anything other than have their, um, uh, their, their lecture recorded. Um, so there's been a whole lot of work put into that. And new software rolled out, which no one's been trained on properly, or they're getting their training virtually and so on. So there was practically no time left for anything else. 
Having said that, some people have quite a low teaching load. Some people are on sabbatical at this term, and some people aren't teaching this term. And those researchers who aren't able to work in the labs because the labs are closed kind of might have a bit of time on their hands. So those research assistants particularly um, might be uh, able to spend that time uh, writing proposals. So we're providing support um, as usual, uh, kind of one-to-one you know, -one doing Zoom meetings or Teams meetings or, or, or whatever, but it's perhaps in a, in a, in a different way. Um, what we don't want to do is add any pressure to any members of staff because some of them are going to be pretty close to, to breaking point and some of my team are pretty close to breaking point. So it's a question of offering uh, support if they feel able to uh, rather than pointing out, uh, do you know what, uh, the university's target is to double research income um, and we need to get that done. So it's a, it's a very much um, that, that more subservient type role uh, rather than the sometimes more dictatorial type role which we, which we sometimes play. So I don't think I've answered that other than to say it's um, a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks, Simon. Uh, and Giannis, just out of curiosity, what are you guys doing with respect to faculty uh, in terms of trying to um, do grant-seeking work while they're at home? Um, well, I have to admit, because the MDC is a research institute without really a lot of teaching, so for us the situation is a bit different. And until now, I have to admit that we have not had uh, to implement any new measures in order to encourage uh, grant seeking. Um, perhaps it is because not such a long time has passed in emergency operation and perhaps because many of the grant application processes were already started, perhaps because of these reasons we are still in more or less normal operation as far as grant seeking and grants applications are concerned. But uh, nevertheless we did uh, intensify our grant seeking in the department, especially through providing up-to-date list of uh, funding opportunities for COVID-19 research. And there have been many new calls on COVID-19 research, and we are circulating this information to our scientific community as quickly as possible. And what we also try to do is assist more with the establishment of new uh, corporations, especially for COVID-19 research. And through our network in Germany and internationally, we are liaising with our colleagues and directing collaboration requests to the right scientists. And, uh, and yeah, of course, we are working also on uh, and making sure that we communicate the rules for running grants and we try to stay up to date, as up to date as possible uh, concerning all these changes. And we believe this is important for the community and that this information can relieve a bit the scientists of extra necessary stress so that they can really concentrate on their scientific work. Thanks, Giannis. I have another question for you. Um, how did your institute manage the existing animal protocols? Were scientists on campus to care for the animals? Okay, thank you, Mark, for that question. This is very important, and it is extremely important to ensure uh, the continuity as far as the uh, animal facilities are concerned. Uh, at the MDC, the animal facility continues functioning normally as caring for the animals is part of the essential operation of the Institute, and uh, there were plan uh, that uh, the uh, animal facility uh, will continue uh, uh, properly and the care of the animals will continue properly was communicated to the whole MDC community even before uh, entering into the emergency operation on March 18th. And additionally, we have a crisis team that meets uh, every day and uh, uh, any news from the animal facility can be addressed uh, as soon as uh, they arise. Until now, there have been no difficulties uh, during the emergency operation and caring for the animals continues as usually. We uh, were confident that it will stay like this. Uh, but uh, uh, definitely we have established a list of personnel that can have access to the institute's premises during this operation, and this includes, of course, the animal caretakers. But it is important to note that we stopped all activities uh, uh, for animal research that involve running new experiments. Uh, so uh, all, all the experiments that, uh, that were running were put uh, on hold where possible, and the exception is, of course, new experiments 
towards COVID-19, they continue normal. Thanks, Giannis. Uh, M Michelle, we have a question for you. Uh, will pending submissions take longer to provide feedback uh, and funding moving from this fiscal year to the next? Uh, what are the implications? Um, we anticipate that there, uh, as I stated in the presentation, we anticipate that all of the reviews will still um, take place only virtually. There may be some delays. Um, depending upon the uh, cases, but for the most part, um, we are still operating under um, receiving applications, um, reviewing the applications. Um, the ICs will also uh, review applications as they have normally done um, using, um, you know, the, the, the requirements that are in place now. Um, I do anticipate that there may be some delays only because we have pushed back um, um, provided extensions for deadlines and that kind of thing. Uh, but we do anticipate that the uh, operations will continue and we'll be trying to minimize delays as much as we can, um, understanding that, you know, there are, you know, just these circumstances that are beyond our control and that uh, we will be receiving applications and emergency applications for the study of COVID-19, as well as those that were already um, in-house or um, uh, put out in funding opportunities um, that are not COVID-related. So, depending just depending upon um, how quickly those applications are in and the fact that we do have our um, study sections in place, virtually, I think we should be um, operating um, as we have, but with Anything such as this, we do know that there may be some delays. We hope not many. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, let's see. The next question is for uh, Giannis. Have you developed a set standard protocol to determine research priorities? In other words, as an institute, is there a standardized system on how you measure cost benefit to discontinuing certain projects? and redirecting resources toward COVID-19 projects. Yes, thank you. So as a rule, COVID-19 products uh, are uh, at a priority now. Uh, I am not sure that there has been a really standardized way with really uh, developed uh, 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 questions or developed conditions about which exact projects uh, have to be reprioritized or stopped. But as a general rule, what we did is that because people cannot have access to the Institute, in principle, all research that takes place on the bench uh, gets stopped. And uh, the research that, of course, is done uh, remotely, it can continue. And excluding, of course, COVID research, as I said before. In cases where some experiments were not uh, it was not possible to stop them. These were situations that they were dealt with by the crisis response team on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, this is something that uh, happened in the crisis team, and this is continuing also in the course of the of the closing operation. But uh, but it is difficult to summarize it as a specific uh, set of rules that we established. Thanks, Giannis. Uh, Michelle, here's another question for you. Uh, if a faculty member has human subjects research that is critical for use in data collection for their project and they cannot do virtual visits due to IRB protocol, what do you advise? Thank you. Oh, that's a really heavy question. Um, so I, I'm the way in which we are looking at this would mean that the um, institution, we would want the institution, of course, to work with the IRB to determine if there are other means by which this um, these visits can be conducted uh, because we want to make sure that, first and foremost, there, you know, the safety of the researchers are um, kept in mind at the institution as well as the um, safety of the uh, patients that are involved in the studies. Um, what I would suggest is that you, um, if there's really not a way around it and the institution doesn't have a standard policy that would allow 
um, for some um, modifications to virtual visits, we really need to have you contact um, the program official within the NIH so we can discuss uh, some ways for um, making certain that the visits happen. And if they um, cannot happen virtually, maybe talking through some other options um, and working with the institution to determine the best way forward. Because again, you know, we want to make sure that the um, researchers are safe, but as well as the um, health and safety of the patients. So I do encourage you to contact your program official. If it's a general question of how a uh, uh, the institution can develop a standard policy working with the IRB, um, and you just want to talk through some scenarios um, with OPERA, that, that is perfectly fine, um, but we will probably be working with our colleagues um, within uh, OER, Office of External Research, in our human subjects area, as well as um, the IC to come up with a holistic approach um, for guiding you in this area. Thank you, Michelle. Simon, we have a question for you um, relative to one of the things you mentioned earlier. How uh, does your organization discover or determine uh, the work-from-home fatigue? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, we actually have a survey which we're just sending around to members of academic staff. Uh, this is specifically... Um, to do with the research excellence framework that I mentioned where every six years the, there's a, a national exercise and we're gathering information for that. Um, that process has been delayed uh, nationally and so the question is should we be delaying it uh, internally and if so by, by how much because we don't yet know the new deadline. So we've sent a survey a very short survey, just three questions, because of course, just adding a survey doesn't help. But um, to um, our, our 800 core academic staff, we've got a response rate of about 20%, actually, which is not too bad, um, all things considered. And it's basically just asking, you know, how have you been affected? Is it affecting your research? Are you able to spend the time for research? Are you able to, to do the research? I can't tell you the results of that yet because of the survey is still open until the end of the week, um, but that we're then going to use that to inform the way in which we uh, centrally provide support for and also can manage the expectations on, on the research work and, and also the research administration work that, that faculty uh, are able to do. Um, I, I guess for my own team, um, then um, we do that through our, uh, I have a uh, a, a meeting every two days with my, my senior managers and they report back on, on the teams which they have a meeting every day with just in terms of how they're able to, to get on with things. In terms of that specific fatigue issue, um, I guess that's something that will build up over time so we'll just have to, to keep revisiting it. Um, I think as I mentioned the university's um, giving us an additional sort of day off this week and, and next week um, which, which is great but actually not so great when you're supporting um, deadlines for people uh, on submissions, so it's a bit of a bit of a two-edged sword. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Michelle, we, we have another question for you. Uh, do you know if other uh, agencies are working together to try to be consistent with guidelines of flexibility? Uh, yes. Hi. Yeah. The, um, I kind of mentioned that and alluded to that in the presentation, um, specifically for administrative flexibilities. But what I'd like to remind folks, and I, I'm famous for doing this, um, we all have to realize that all of the 26 different federal agencies have uh, different missions and different laws and different requirements. So there may be some instances where some of the um, agencies are not able to provide the administrative flexibilities based on um, laws and program regulations, but where they are, um, where there is not a strong legislative voice, um, the OMB has been very um, supportive and clear that we should be pro providing the same, if not similar, flexibilities um, to our recipients. Um, I do know that uh, uh, Jean Feldman within the um, NSF National Science Foundation and several of us um, that have research portfolios, um, Jean's leading a effort where we're kind of talking through some of the flexibilities and making certain that, you know, we're all um, hearing and seeing and applying um, some of these flexibilities in a, in a similar way. 
But for the most part, I will say we are trying to do that. Um, and then, of course, there are some agencies that, you know, have community-based grants, service grants that, um, um, you know, the way in which the flexibilities are applicable may be slightly different from biomedical research grants for the reasons that I've previously stated. But I will say that we are working very hard together try to make sure that those flexibilities are similar. Um, NIH has maximized the uh, um, the flexibility um, memos that uh, OMB has put out because, like I said, some of these flexibilities were already applicable to our biomedical research grant. Um, and so just expanding those has made it very easy for us where it may not be the case for others. Um, but if there's a scenario or a situation where you have a question about that, um, you know, feel free to contact me and maybe I can contact the individuals at the other agencies or maybe we can all just kind of provide um, similar and share our um, FAQs, which ours are publicly available so that people may come up with ideas that maybe they didn't think of um, and, and utilize and capitalize and leverage uh, some of our um, answers as well. Thanks, Michelle. That, that leads me to another question um, that you... you given your response, uh, and, and you mentioned Gene, and I know obviously you and Gene have worked together on a lot of things uh, over the years uh, and continue to. How are uh, agencies like NIH and NSF and the other large grant-making agencies, can, can you tell us how you guys are staying in communications in terms of what sort of frequency you're connecting? Do you have standing meetings at this point? Um, just for the curiosity of, of people who are with us, understanding that not, not you're not necessarily working in a vacuum when it comes to all of this. Yeah, no, we are not. We're not working in a vacuum at all. Um, we do not have uh, standing meetings. We have actually just kind of um, taken it upon ourselves to um, meet in um, OMB um, charged uh, us with coming together and discussing some of the uh, requirements and and looking at how they have been applied and, and what we need to do to try to, you know, drive some consistency. Um, and we're really grateful for that charge. And, and, and you know, Gene and I take that quite literal. So um, we have had um, one or two calls. But on, on a regular, I, I promise you, I reach out to any and everyone that I can. Um, just to kind of get an idea of what they're thinking, uh, and so that I don't necessarily put them in a bind if um, if I'm issuing administrative flexibilities. You know, this is how we're applying it to our research grants. Um, something to think about, and you know, highlighting the areas where um, 2 CFR may allow for some of this, um, you know, the more creative uh, thinking, if you will. Um, and I just try to do that on a consistent basis. Um, but I do like the idea of maybe us thinking about doing something more, um, crystallizing something more formal, formal and post this meeting, I, I can put out a note just, um, offering that suggestion just so that, um, as, as the material continues to come out, we will continue to, to make, um, headway in that way and, and working with the department as well. So that's a good idea. Thanks. Thanks. That's great to hear, Michelle. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I would say uh, for either of our university folks here, um, how are your institutions dealing with inequities in IT? You had mentioned a lot uh, went into the planning for this um, at MDC. Did you have any uh, thoughts about how uh, th that uh, can be uh, done better? Uh, well, yes, I have. There is for sure. Uh, for uh, now that we have the situation, we could definitely devise a plan for the future so that uh, we are more prepared. That the home office uh, capabilities are set for all our people, either through uh, uh, computers from work or through making use of the personal computers with the proper uh, IT uh, IT programs. 
But uh, of course, the problem of bandwidth, as uh, Simon mentioned earlier, this is very difficult to solve. I cannot see how the institution could do something about that, but we can definitely make sure that the equipment is there and we can definitely make sure that we have most of our processes in an ideal world, all our processes uh, working paperless so that we do not need to uh, get access to printed documents and we don't need to go to the office in order to uh, to find some printout of some sort. So I think the more we are going into digital workflows and uh, and document management systems and making sure that we have remote access, of course, taking into consideration our IT uh, security uh, conditions, then this can make a future uh, uh, situation like this much more uh, doable with a minimal loss uh, in productivity. So definitely I can see a, a, a great room for improvement there. Thanks, Giannis. Uh, Michelle, we have another another question for you. Uh, will NIH allow automatic carryover on fellowship awards, e.g. budgeted travel was canceled due to COVID, to be used towards future travel or other budget category spending? Yes, um, that is one of the uh, questions that we have out on our external website, and the answer to that question is yes. We will be providing maximum flexibility. Great, great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, for, for Simon and Giannis, uh, I mean, you can start. How do you continue any international collaborations at the moment, especially for projects that mandate any type of travel? Yeah, okay, that's interesting, isn't it? So, in terms of the travel, then that just has to be uh, has to be put on hold. And that, I think, as Michelle just mentioned, we have a very similar for the UK uh, funders, uh, where they're saying, "Well, um, if you can't travel, then we will cover those expenses. You can." rebook and do things later on and they've even said that uh, if you lose that flight but you still need to do it um, then you know in exceptional circumstances they will increase your grant by the amount that you couldn't recover and you'd still need to spend if you can't buy it from other places um, the, the problem is that you know if travel was absolutely necessary to uh, the proposal uh, to the project then it then it's going to have to happen it's just the, the project is going to be delayed it could be that the reason for the travel was in order to have a workshop or something which is just more efficient, but actually you could still get that very efficient two-day workshop done over the three-month period where you're not able to travel by doing emails and so on. So it might just be a sort of a, a reprofiling, if you like, and then the travel no longer becomes required. It's just the research takes longer, but that's okay because you had longer. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Iannis, do you want to comment on uh, that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as far as the existing international co uh, collaborations that we have, I think it is very interesting that mostly we are noticing that for the uh, smaller meetings or the uh, smaller scale meetings, a lot is possible through uh, virtual uh, meetings. This is something that before, because uh, of the fact that so many meetings were taking place and there uh, were, of course, collaboration meetings happening, uh, flanking big conferences, people were used to discussing face-to-face. Uh, -face. But I think for the existing corporations, there is a lot that can be done remotely. I don't think that if the situation, unless the situation stays for a long period of time, I don't think there will be a significant impact on the existing uh, international corporations. I think, of course, this becomes a bit more difficult with the establishment of new corporations because there, without the personal interaction, it is much more difficult to embark on something new uh, when uh, having seen the person only on a screen. I think there, if, this, if the current situation continues for longer, this will be become a bit uh, a bit more difficult uh, but uh, but I think at the moment we have had a positive experience on how effective also a virtual uh, a virtual meeting can be okay uh, thank you Giannis. Um Michelle we've, we've got another one for you uh, do you have any idea what the anticipated turnaround time for review and funding of emergency applications um, it will be expedited. I can't give you um, a um, specific timeline, but we everything is expedited under the emergency application. Um, there will be expedited review, evaluation of those applications, 
um, and they are being given the priority. So um, the time frame by which they are normally reviewed and um, and and responses back to our, our applicants um, that will be drastically different than what you um, have, um, you know, what most of us have experienced in the past. We do have um, some um, of our FOAs at this point on hold just to add some additional language to it from um, the department. But uh, once those, once that information is added, they will be cleared and then it will be on a fast track to review an award. So, um, yes, please stay tuned. If you put something in and you haven't heard back, um, feel free to uh, reach out and inquire, but it should be on a fast track. Thanks, Michelle. We, we've got another one uh, here for you. Uh, how do you think uh, this pandemic will affect future NIH funding? It appears that we've already seen increased funding being rerouted through NIAID. Do you expect for the various institutes and centers to experience significant redistribution of funding relative to previous years? Um, I don't, I, I, that I don't know. Um, I, I can inquire, but I don't have any intel into that, um, unfortunately. And a related question uh, uh, to this is, do you expect to see an overall decrease in the amount of NIH funding provided this year? Uh, no, I will say that there is going to be, uh, I don't think that there's going to be a decrease in funding. Um, I think it's going to be an effort to get uh, all of our other activities um, obligated and out the, out the door, but we are looking at ways um, for doing that uh, in order to uh, make sure that, um, you know, previously committed awards um, like our non-competing continuations are funded and for those new awards that are coming in that are not um, COVID-related. But I don't, I think it's just going to be a um, interesting uh, challenge for the enterprise to to make awards um, um, as quickly as we can. Um, but I don't anticipate there being uh, the funding uh, amounts going down. I think it's just going to be really, honestly, it's going to be hard to try to figure out how to get the funding out um, timely um, in a truncated time frame. Um, and so we, like I said, we do have some um, options for our institutes and centers that we put out in staff guidance, um, and they are, at their discretion, can use um, those options um, to the best of their ability. And um, making sure that folks know that, you know, the commitment is definitely to issue awards um, in, a, in a timely manner and making sure that, the, like I said, the previously committed ones are, um, are awarded and um, getting them done before the end of the fiscal year. And that is very much a real question <laughs> and a real challenge, but um, we are committed to trying to do so. Thank you, Michelle. And, and, and we have a question um, for, for each of you. Um, obviously, I think we're all sort of experiencing some challenges around this. Can you talk about how you've tried to keep a team feel with your staff, um, given given the circumstances? Simon, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I talked about the I talked about the quiz, which I think was actually quite a quite a you know, a good thing for bringing people together. Um, and I didn't set the question, so that was set by some of the other team members. So so that was quite good. It was an interesting challenge. It was also a good way uh, to get to, to learn to use Microsoft Teams, which we had sort of rolled out across the university within three days, and it normally takes about three years. Um, so so that was that was fun. Um, I as I say, I have um, a team meetings once every two days with my my senior leadership team, and they have daily meetings with, with, with their team. Um, other than that, it's it's difficult. Um, what I've heard other people do, but I haven't tried this yet, is to use something like Microsoft Teams for official work business, but then use something like WhatsApp, set up WhatsApp groups to do um, sort of more personal stuff. Um, having said that, I find that the video calls I do with my staff um, means that I find out more about them anyway. Because you see, you know, unless they've put on the, uh, the the fancy background of the the beach or whatever you see a little bit of their house and you can just have a, you know, a non-invasive conversation about uh, oh you know I, I didn't know you had a rock collection you know, or whatever it might be that's in the background so so I think that that does lead itself to giving you a bit of a way into into a cohesion um, but I am really worried about this sort of 
team spirit going forward. And I think one of the things I want to uh, echo from what Yanis said earlier, which is for those collaborative things, it, the initial meeting really has to be uh, an in-person meeting. It, you just don't get that that dynamic uh, on, on the on the virtual meetings, at least not with our current technology. Yanis, uh, did, did you want to comment on uh, the same question? Uh, how you're keeping your team feeling connected at this point? Yes, uh, so I think this is one of the most difficult elements of the time because to get projects running uh, for the people that can work at home, yes, we mentioned it before, it's possible to continue individually. But for the team feeling, I think this is a, this is a great challenge because there are pros and cons for any direction. Very uh, often meetings then can be too demanding, but uh, if we don't have too many meetings, uh, many meetings regularly, then people could feel lost. I am not sure that we have uh, like a golden solution there that uh, uh, I could uh, yeah, suggest to people. But what I can say is that we are trying to respond to the uh, to what we hear from the people. So when it is working well with the, with our weekly meeting and with the one on one interactions, uh, depending on the other projects, then we kind of assume that this is a positive approach. But if we hear from uh, some team member that something is not going well, they don't know exactly what somebody else is doing, then we try to respond quickly to that. But uh, but it is difficult to to say for sure that this is the the best approach. We have tried to use a self-hosted uh, chat service that we have at the institute so that we can have a more informal communication. But this has had mixed results until now because, of course, if you don't know that everybody from the team is there receiving the messages in real time, then it is difficult to, to use this sort of communication. So we have had the mixed feelings as far as these uh, self-hosted chat services are concerned. Thanks, Giannis. And, and Michelle, I'm sure, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you, you've got a lot going on, and, and I'm sure you're, uh, you and your team are having very long days at this point, trying to keep up with the volume of questions you're getting. Um, do you have anything you want to share um, with us about how you're helping your um, team feel like they're connected during this time? Yes. Um, so, you know, typically we have our um, all-hands meetings monthly, and what I've tried to do is really just um, stay connected weekly with each one of my division directors, and then um, we're doing bi-weekly huddles. Um, just to make sure that, uh, you know, the virtual meetings and Skyping and um, video conferencing and uh, WebEx and all the things that we need to see together um, are, are working. And everything works, right, until it doesn't work. <laughs> and so uh, we've had times where we've called into meetings and, you know, we've had to call in three or four times because, you know, you can't get through the conference line. Of course, in person is always better um, because, you know, you do feel connected. But what we've been doing and what I've been doing is connecting with the folks um, starting at 7, 7.30 in the morning, Eastern Standard, just to uh, sit and go through, talk through some of our questions. And to be quite honest, I think we've been more deliberate about being connected and connecting and touching and having our touch points um, daily. Uh, so that we are all on the same page, um, that we all understand the questions and um, the terminology and breaking out questions where they spin off into different questions and um, as well as trying to maintain our normal portfolio, um, which is hard, right, because you really want to be very responsive and, and proactive in how we're addressing the questions from the community. Um, and we know that it's hard um, for our researchers and faculty members, um, as well as uh, our research administrators that are, you know, trying to get answers to the questions that are coming in and trying to think of them um, ahead of time. So we have been very deliberate. And I will say that I, um, I've kind of developed a, an appetite for having our touch points in the morning as often as we do versus us starting our day and kind of going in different directions and meeting up. Um, during the week to download, we've been very intentional, and I've been very intentional with my 
management team about us having our touch points in the morning and they work well um, and it really does set the course for the day and it sets the course for us being able to meet the needs of our community and that's just really important for us right now. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, Simon, I, I wanted to come back to, I cut off your joke very early on, so I wanted to, I wanted to end on a high note, if you can help us with some British humor. <laughs> on a high note. Oh, dear. Well, it's, okay, it's a short joke. Um, the joke goes, uh, what color socks do bears wear? And I, I, know you I don't know. know. What color on. socks? Well, actually, bears don't wear socks because they've got bare feet. Yeah, is that the temple we work in here? I'm sure there are people laughing somewhere virtually, Simon. I, you got Michelle to laugh. I'm using so that one, there you Simon. Go. I'm using it. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your questions. Um, I wanted to also remind everyone that this webinar recording and slides will be available on our website www.ncura.edu slash global webinar, where you can find also uh, the last webinar uh, recording and slides that we had uh, with Gene Feldman and uh, two other universities, uh, international university speakers. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers here today, Simon Carriage, Giannis Ligoris, and Michelle Bowles for this really important and informative session. We are really thankful to have all of you in our community. Uh, I'd also like to thank my Incura colleagues behind the scenes for this program. Thanks for keeping me together on this. And, and lastly, uh, please stay healthy and safe out there, everyone. This webinar was produced by Incura, the National Council of University Research Administrators. For more information on our programs and resources, visit www.ncura.edu. Thank you. <laughs>